there. Welcome to the PM services, the evening services for the Northfield Church of Christ for Sunday, December the 27th. We'll be praising the Lord in song, offering prayers, and I'll deliver a message that I hope will uh, benefit all of us. So if you would like to sing along with us, if you will turn your songbooks, Songs of Faith and Praise, to number 103, 103. We're going to sing this through twice. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. And if you would turn, please, to number 148. Another quick and snappy song. 148. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me over and over and over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me over and over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He keeps cleansing me over and over and over and over and over again. He keeps cleansing me over and over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. And if you would turn to number 172. <clears throat> After the song, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. 172. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise His holy name. 
I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to praise His holy name. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to love the Lord. I just came to love the Lord. I just came to praise His holy name. I just came to love the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord and Savior, we're just so glad that uh, we can just take a short time out of our Sunday evening to commune with you, uh, just to sing songs of praise because you indeed are worthy of our praise and we hallow your name, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you so much at, at this season of the year that our thoughts turn to your bringing Jesus into the world. And though uh, people tend to uh, just venerate Christmas, it's not the work of the Lord in the manger that uh, meant everything. It was the work that your son did on the cross. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to always abide in you through your son. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to offer prayers to you and uh, help those prayers to be uh, prayers of thanks. Uh, help those prayers to be prayers of, of uh, condolences. Help us to pray for others that are in need. Bless our friend Pat as she goes through the, some turmoils that are in her life. And I pray that you would be with my neighbor Juan as his, his father, Juan Carrasco, passed away last week, and I pray that you would be with that family and their loss. Be with each, us, each of us, dear Heavenly Father, through this evening. Uh, help us, dear Heavenly Father, to think of you and think of how much we love you, how much we care for you, and how much we need you. Pray this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. <clears throat> and the song before the lesson is number 156. One, fifty-six. Beautiful, beautiful, Jesus is beautiful, and Jesus makes beautiful things of my life. Carefully touching me, causing my eyes to see that Jesus makes beautiful things of my life. Oh, thank you so much for singing with us. And I hope that the Lord was praised in our song. I thought we would kind of uh, finish up the Christmas season this evening. And uh, since uh, December 25th is, is that day, and we've, we've talked about it uh, a little bit over the past couple of weeks, uh, is the day that the world turns and thinks of Jesus' birth. Uh, and uh, two weeks ago, we talked about the ramifications of uh, that day and uh, you know when that uh, celebration began in somewhere around 300 to 350 A.D. Uh, last week, we talked about some of the attributes of Mary. And uh, those attributes were those that uh, we might want to engender in our life. 
And so finally, as we kind of get out of the season, kind of wean our way out of it, so to speak, I'd like to talk for a few moments this evening about the message of the birth of Jesus. What's the message involved in it? Most of the world has just, at least most of the Christian world, let me uh, clarify that, has just celebrated the birth of Jesus. And, uh, you know, it, it's a joyful time. But the reality of all this is that uh, the rejoicing should not be because the baby was in the manger. It should be because the grown man was on the cross. God's son went to the cross for our sins. Had Jesus had stayed in the manger, and that's the only Jesus that we deal with, the baby Jesus in the manger. And, and let's face it, he came into the world uh, born of the Holy Spirit, but he did come into the world in a natural way through a physical mother. Um, if he would have stayed in the manger, and that's all that we would have thought about, and that's all that we think about, and we think more highly of that than we think of Jesus' teachings, or we think of his death and his burial and his resurrection, we would have stayed in the darkness of our sin. And that is the abject truth. And so in the Old Testament, we have many, uh, we like to call them messianic prophecies. We have many, many uh, prophetical words written about the coming of Jesus. And Isaiah, probably more than any, is the prophet that talks about the coming of Jesus. I'd like us to zoom in on the ninth chapter of the book of Isaiah. So if you have your Bibles with you this evening, if you turn them to the ninth chapter, or if you do this on your devices, if you would turn to the ninth chapter of Isaiah, the ninth chapter explains the benefits of the coming son. It begins by talking about the joy that the son would bring. And so if we look at Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, here are the words. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You sh shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence, as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. All, the, all that goes up to the harvest is the hard work, isn't it? It's the planting, it's the watering, it's the fertilizing, it is the de-weeding, all of the hard, hard work that results in the harvest. The birth of Jesus was one of those things that led up to the harvest. Now, to amplify on this, uh, that uh, the people who walk in the darkness will see a great light, let's look at Jesus' words in John chapter 8, verse 12, where he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Do you notice how we transitioned from the baby Jesus to the man Jesus? Those who rejoice in the light will be delivered from the bondage of sin, the yoke of enslavement, in the case of the Jews back in those days, the yoke 
of the law, the, the enslavement of idolatry. You know, there is no greater slave-master relationship than the relationship of man to sin. In John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus said anyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The Apostle Paul uh, kind of echoed uh, that truth in uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. Thanks be to the Son that we do not live under that bondage, whether it be for the Jews the bondage of the old law or under the bondage of living the way that the world lives, of living in sin. And it is that world that made men sinners. And so what I would like us to do in Isaiah chapter 9 is start with verse 2. And it says, For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders. Okay, those who rejoice in the light will be delivered from sin. If we are in the light of Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity to be delivered from sin, not to be a slave to sin. Jesus said, you know, man can't serve man and mammon, man and money at the same time. He'll either love one and hate the other or hate one and love the other. A man can't serve two masters. By that same token, humans can't follow in sin, and they can't live a life of sin. And so first, through Jesus, it says you'll break the yoke of burden. That yoke, you know, kind of symbolizes something that holds us down, and sin will hold us down. Secondly, in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, let's look at these words carefully. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called, get this, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to his increase. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Again, do you notice how quickly it transitioned from a child will be born to us. Then the government will rest upon his shoulders. Guess what? The government did not rest upon the shoulders of the baby Jesus laying in the manger. All right, the government rested on Jesus the man and Jesus' teachings. And the message of the birth of the Son is that he governs us even yet today. All right, he has been to the cross, he has died for our sins, he has resurrected from the dead through the power of the Father. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Psalm chapter 110 and verse 3. And his decisions, 
His decisions are based on justice and on righteousness. Now, you know, sometimes when we look at the world, it looks almost as if the wicked are winning. All right? It looks almost as if the wicked are winning. And what we don't think about and we need to is the final judgment. It's at the final judgment that the wicked will not be winning. Paul reminds us that God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. Again, as we look at the world today, it's almost as if corruption rules, that wickedness is the standard. But in the final days, the Son will judge that righteous judgment, and all the wrongs will be punished, and all the rights will be rewarded. His reign will exist until Judgment Day. And so when Jesus rose and went up into the sky, his, his words to the disciples were, All authority has been given to me under heaven and on earth. And he holds that authority until the Day of Judgment. And when he judges, then the authority will go back to the Father, and the Father will reign supreme. Is this me talking? Am I just making this up out of thin air? This is what the Apostle Paul writes to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 23 through 28. Now, when you hear various people's names, what conjures up within your mind? You know, in, in our country, when you hear the name George Washington, when you hear the name Abraham Lincoln, when you hear the name Dr. Martin Luther King, these, these were men of character. And in biblical times, one's name stood for one's character. And you know what? We would hope that this is still true today. But in, in biblical times, it was, it was the name, and the name denoted the character. Note the names that are given to the Son in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. It says, his name will be called, ready, Wonderful Counselor. Do you know what a counselor is? A counselor is someone who guides someone else. A counselor is one whose words are wonderful. Jesus was our counselor. He was our high priest. He was our king. He ruled for a period of time, and he still rules today because all authority has been given to us. He's given us special counsel. If you don't believe that, read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Some of the most profound words that have ever been written. These are words of counsel. Blessed are, love your enemy, the greatest commandments. These are words of counsel so that you and I might live our lives the way we should live them. So the Son is the mighty counselor. And so it says his name will be called Mighty Counselor. Then it will be or it should be Wonderful Counselor, then it will be Mighty God. Now, 
when Jesus is called mighty God, when the Son is called mighty God, it means that he is identified as part of the Godhead. You know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is the mighty God. He is equal in power and in deity. If we turn to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, and we read that, we will see that that's true. We serve that mighty God. We even sing a song that says, what a mighty God we serve. Right? What a mighty God we serve. All right, so the son was called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, and then he was called Eternal Father. Eternal. That's not a name that exists on earth. <laughs> All right? For everything on earth is not eternal. However, Jesus is referred to as Eternal Father. When we go to John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. That Word is Jesus. He was there at the beginning. He was attendant at the creation of all things. Our God, our Jesus, the Son, is the Eternal Father and the Creator of all things. It's repeated over and over in our New Testaments. And fourth, all right, let's go through them. He's wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father. And finally, it says he is the prince of peace. Prince of peace. We find true peace through Jesus Christ. He is the author of peace. We can have peace of mind through Jesus Christ. We have the assurity, because he's the eternal father, that we can live in eternity with him because he's the prince of peace. And we are saved by grace because of our faith and because of our obedience. Not only does he give us peace individually, but he sees through that we can have peace between men. You know, when we look at our churches, we see people living at peace with one another. It is this peace that we look for. Every Lord's Day when we come together, we experience the peace the peace that God has to offer us through his blessed Son. And he is the only means of peace. If you would like to give reference to this, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 and 18. And so as we conclude this evening, this lesson on the message of the birth Although there is nowhere in the Bible that commands us to honor the day that Jesus was born, aren't all of us happy that it took place? Aren't we all just amazed at the wonderful story of the beautiful woman Mary who God chose? the faithful earthly father, Joseph, who followed God's uh, commands as to what he was supposed to do, that angel showed up and gave message to Joseph, gave message to Mary, that it was the Holy Spirit that impregnated the Virgin Mary, and so Jesus is born of the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful story. The, the humble beginning. You know, we know it. There wasn't any room 
there in the inn in Bethlehem. And so they wound up in a, in a stable. And Jesus was laid in a trough. You know, it, the, the polite word is a manger. You know what it was? It was a trough where they put hay, where the animals could come and eat out of the hay. It was a feeding trough. That's where Jesus wound up lying. And, and I think part of this was to show the humility with which he came into the world. And so we're thankful that God put deity in human form. All right? We're thankful for that. That's, that's a wonderful blessing for us. And so we give pause in late December to remember that Jesus came into the world in an extraordinary, extraordinary way. And so his physical birth made all of these things possible. And it was all the blessings that Isaiah explained to us in chapter 9. And it might be good for you to read and meditate Isaiah chapter 9 as kind of an addendum to the birth story of Jesus Christ. How Isaiah so clearly, how clearly declared it. His birth declared messages to the world. His, his birth declared that this man would be a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an eternal father, a prince of peace. It was through it would be through obeying him through faith that we have the opportunity to live eternally with the Lord. And so the big question is not whether we've celebrated Christmas. It's not whether we've given presents to one another. The question is, have we received the messages so that we can be the blessed people who used to walk in darkness? who now walk in the light that is Jesus Christ. And that's where it has come full circle, that we walk in the light, that Jesus is the light of the world. And you know what? He calls on us to be the light of the world. He calls us to send the message out. He tells us not to hide the light under a bushel, but to be proud of who and what we are. And, you know, again, when we're Christians, that name Christian should stand for character and integrity that we should own up to and take pride in as children of God and as ambassadors for God and clinging to the teachings of his son. I hope all of us were uplifted by this message this evening. Let's close in prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this short amount of time that we were able to spend together. We just pray that uh, there was a lesson here for each of us that we can uh, take with us uh, through the evening that uh, we can just think about what the baby Jesus became and how important that is to each one of us. Bless us as we live our lives, that we would be proud to be called Christians, that we would just uh, in all ways uh, remember that you are our God and Jesus is our Savior. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, through the evening. Help us to go to sleep with you on our mind and wake up with you on our mind and in our hearts. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father. Be with us. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe, and may God bless you all. Joyful.